it's a great pleasure to at last just as he leaves <laughs> Cambridge to catch up as they say with Stephen Toop. Stephen when where, and where were you born? I was born in uh, Montreal in Canada and uh, in 1958 on the 14th of February so I'm a Valentine's Day baby. Oh, well, that's led to your romantic life through, right, throughout your... Well, one, one might hope. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Um, I usually start with a person's grandparents, if they knew them, um, to establish the kind of family they come from. Did you know your grandparents? Well, it's important for me to say that I'm adopted. So oh. I knew my adoptive grandparents mm. on really only one side of my mm. family. My, uh, m my adoptive mother's parents had died before I was born, so I did not mm -hmm. uh, really know them at all. Uh, but my adoptive grandparents, my father's parents, were from Newfoundland, and they mm -hmm. came up, they grew up uh, in a very small uh, village called uh, Trinity on Trinity Bay, and we used mm -hmm. to visit them every summer for mm -hmm. many years, driving across Newfoundland, which then had uh, only um, unpaved roads for 500 miles. It was quite something. Uh, so I got to know them uh, quite well. Uh, my grandmother's family uh, was from Jersey. Mm. Her name was de Gresh. Mm. Uh, and so I, I had never been to Jersey, although I'm about yeah. to go for mm. the first time ever. Uh, I didn't know my grandfather very well because he died uh, when I was quite young. But I do remember him being a person of great um, sort of dignity. He was a carpenter. Uh, and uh, he was, uh, a, by all accounts, a very uh, good carpenter. Mm. My grandmother was a rather uh, tough uh, woman, if I may mm. put it that way, uh, rather harsh uh, and uh, full of judgment. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Religious? Uh, yes, uh, Anglican, uh, mm. quite strongly, or a Church of England, mm. as we would say here. And my father, uh, I'll come to that later, uh, actually became an Anglican priest. Did he? All right. Well, let's, let's get on to your parents, um, or step-parents, I mean, they're, they're adopted Adoptive parents. parents, yes. Adoptive parents. I mean, it may be not something you want to explain, but one or two people have been affected by being adopted. Well, I've yes, no, I, 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 I'm serenely untroubled uh, yeah. by being adopted. Uh, my parents were absolutely wonderful people, mm. uh, and I was adopted as a baby. Mm. Uh, I always knew from any time of cognizance uh, mm. that I was adopted, and it simply wasn't an issue for me at all. Mm. Uh, I thought of my parents as my parents, and that was the end of the story. Mm. Well, well, tell me about them. Uh, my father, as I said, became an Anglican priest. He grew up in this uh, village, uh, was, which was really a fishing village uh, on the coast of Newfoundland. Uh, at 16, he became a school teacher because mm. there was no training mm. required. And he obviously was um, capable of uh, teaching at a very basic level. And then uh, he uh, began uh, to think that he uh, might have a vocation in the priesthood. Uh, he did a little bit of training in Newfoundland, but there was really no theological college. There was no university at the time in Newfoundland. It was uh, before it joined Confederation uh, with Canada. And so he ended up coming to uh, study at a university called Bishop's University in uh, Quebec. And uh, it was there through his brother, uh, who had, was already in Quebec, uh, he worked at a, a, a shipyard, mm -hmm. uh, that, he, that my father met my mother, who was the niece of my uncle's <laughs> wife. <laughs> so it was rather complicated. Uh, she was both m my aunt and great aunt, I guess, or my mother's aunt and great aunt. Mm -hmm. uh, and in any event, uh, they met uh, and uh, they uh, ended up uh, getting married. And then they were immediately posted back to Newfoundland. My mother had never really been outside of Montreal. She grew up in a, mm -hmm. a very um, modest, uh, with a modest mm -hmm. background. Her father was a tool and dye maker mm -hmm. and worked for Marconi uh, mm -hmm. Corporation uh, until he died very young, uh, having been gassed in the First World War. So he didn't ever have a, a robust health after that. And I think it was a real shock for my mother uh, when they moved back to Newfoundland because not only were they in this rather uh, small and uh, very rural province, but they were actually posted to a very small island off the north coast of Newfoundland <laughs> called Change Island, mm. my mother never having been out of a big city in her mm. life before. 
but uh, they made do, and uh, and I think they made friends, and uh, it, they always remembered that as a very important formative experience, I think, in their lives. But then after uh, that, my father had committed to going back to Newfoundland for some time because I think they'd help pay for his education, mm. uh, the Diocese of Newfoundland. And then ultimately they came back to Montreal, and uh, then my father's whole career was uh, in and around uh, the Diocese of Montreal. Tell me about that character and how it might have influenced you. Oh, uh, in so many ways. Uh, I would say that, uh, first off, they were both people of tremendous integrity. Uh, they were they were warm. Uh, they were um, gentle-spirited, I would say, uh, particularly my mother. Uh, she worked as a, a parish secretary uh, mm. for much of her life. Uh, and they were uh, very kind people, very committed to the parish, committed to the community. Uh, right from the very beginning, um, I was expected uh, to participate in, in activities with adults. I was never kept away. Uh, I was in the choir when I was young and very involved in the church myself. And I think I just grew up with a sense that one participated actively in the community. Uh, I would also say that my parents were very uh, interested in um, in just making the world a better place, if I may put it as directly as that. Uh, everything they did was really about trying to improve social circumstances. I, I would say that my father grew up in, in the Anglo-Catholic leftist circles, if that's a, 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 an interesting uh, grouping uh, and and that was always influential in his life and my mother was less interested in politics per se but very interested in the community mm. so we've got to skip through your education quickly yes and I always ask people what their first memory was um, not just a sort of tree waving over their pram but something <laughs> concrete um, do have a first memory or one or two? I'm terrible about uh, going back to very early days with memory. Uh, however, I would say that the first uh, a memory that was particularly salient for me and this still ha uh, has an implication, I think, in the way I think about the world. Uh, believe it or not, I'll, I'll go right to grade five. So it's a long way. It's a long way into uh, uni into school. But I, That's about the age of 10? Yes, it? about the age of 10. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I was um, about to go into that grade level at school, and I heard that I was going to be uh, given uh, to a teacher into a class of Mrs. Baldwin. I'll never mm -hmm. forget. And uh, Mrs. Baldwin had a reputation for being a dragon. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember the entire summer before I went into that grade being absolutely uh, distraught. And you know, my stomach was bothering me. I was very worried. And I thought, oh, this is going to be a disaster. Well, needless to say, I got into grade five. I started uh, to get to know Mrs. Baldwin, who was extraordinary, uh, a really great teacher demanding and I suppose that was where mm. the reputation came from but fundamentally committed and if one was a a, a good student mm. uh, she could help you uh, make tremendous progress and I learned from that that you should never always you should never rely on other people's judgments of people you have to make your own assessments right um, let's sadly move on from your first school where did you go sort of for secondary school? Then? So my secondary school was a public high school, uh, or state school, uh, in a suburb of Montreal called Beaconsfield, and it was called Beaconsfield High School. Mm. Um, it actually was a very good school. When I was there, it was rated as the third best uh, state school in, in Canada. Wow. Uh, so I was very lucky, mm. and I had really superb teachers from uh, in this case, what we would call grade seven, so I was about 13 right through um, to uh, the end of, of uh, high school. Uh, and in every year, I had really excellent teachers who pushed me. They were creative. It was a very uh, a forward-thinking school. It gave a lot of um, self-direction and freedom uh, to design one's own programs, within structures, of course. Uh, but I, I had a whole series of teachers who had a big impact on my life, 
one I must single yes, out uh, <laughs> was a, a man named John Whitman, who was my grade 10 North American literature teacher, and then in grade 11, which was the final year in Quebec, uh, he was my theater uh, teacher, and I also uh, did a lot of acting, and he was the mm -hmm. principal director. Uh, in North American literature, he just completely engaged me with uh, great, great writers uh, from you know Hawthorne right through to um, T. S. Eliot, who we'll call, call a North American in this context, <laughs> uh, and uh, it, it really had a huge impact on my life, and it actually affected choices I made for for a university. But it was in the theater that the biggest difference was made. He challenged. He was not an easy man, <laughs> but he challenged so forcefully, and the quality of these productions, the expectation for young high school based actors was really high. And uh, I think it set me up for life in quite in many, many ways. So what sort of plays? Uh, uh, wide range. We did a play. Well, the, the most famous would be Romeo and Juliet, yeah. uh, which uh, was a, a great play? production. I was Friar Lawrence. <laughs> uh, and I uh, actually loved the part, partly because the director, John Whitman, felt that he was a, a, a truly pivotal character and perhaps had been underrepresented in the play, which is why he cast me. So he actually made the part in some ways uh, more impressive than it often is in productions. And, and I loved the experience. Also did a, a play called Story Theatre, which was really about um, fairy tales, which was really fun. Uh, uh, and um, it, it, so a wide variety of things over the years. Mm. When you say it set you up for life, mm. um, is that implying that as vice chancellor you've been acting? In the time? Well, I think that as a professor, uh, if I may say, uh, having to obviously profess mm. uh, and and be in front of groups for a long time that having acting experience just the knowledge of how to project well the knowledge of how to hold oneself mm. the knowledge of how to a sense uh, w w the reaction of uh, people in front of you I think that that's been extremely mm. helpful helpful in my professorial career and then uh, look roles bring certain types of expectations mm. just the other day I was called upon to uh, announce the accession of King Charles III mm. from the steps of Senate House. And there's no doubt that my acting experience was absolutely crucial <laughs> to that, uh, to that uh, job. Mm. Mm. Was there anyone else, any other teachers who want to single out in that school? In that school, oh, there are so many. I had one, um, uh, Mr. Stevens, in grade mm. nine. Uh, and what was wonderful about him, he was an English teacher, and he had a... Uh, a system whereby you could uh, choose to essentially go ahead of the curriculum mm. if you were cap capable of doing that. There was a lot mm. of flexibility in the class and so two or three of us in the class just did more and more and mm. more and and he what subject uh, English, English. Uh, uh, and he English literature primarily and he would uh, really encourage and create opportunities for you to do extra work, uh, and, but he would be engaged with it. It wasn't just you went off on your own. He, he helped shape the work, he helped um, encourage you, but also criticize. And it was a wonderful experience because it, it allowed uh, uh, those who chose to do so to move forward much more quickly and expanded horizons. Mm. So he's another one I would single out. Mm. Around sort of 1415 in Anglicanism, you usually get confirmed mm -hmm. and it's also the time certainly in my experience of uh, beginning of real religious interest and enthusiasm mm -hmm. which lasted a few years uh, can you tell me something about your religious Yes, well, uh, as I mentioned, uh, I, uh, I always was involved with the church because of my uh, parents' engagement, and uh, more particularly, I was a singer, so I was a boy soprano, and uh, throughout my early uh, years, from about seven onwards, uh, I sang, uh, and uh, it was very, very important to me. So the moment of confirmation, uh, and in fact, I think I was 13 when that happened, um, really was just a continuation. It wasn't a fundamental mm. shift for me. Uh, I, I remember it being a meaningful moment. It, mm. it was rather odd because 
uh, it was a time of, of great population expansion in Canada, and I was in the largest um, uh, class of confirmands uh, that my church had ever seen. I think there were 83 of us getting <laughs> confirmed at the same time. And I, I knew the bishop uh, because of mm -hmm. my father, and uh, I liked him very much, uh, Bishop Kenneth McGuire. And so it... it uh, it, uh, it was a meaningful experience and then I continued um, as a singer and then as my voice changed uh, I became a, a, a baritone and um, so I, I just remained very much a part of the fabric of the church and then later became much more active uh, in other ways uh, as I grew up. Have you, so have you remained a Christian? I have absolutely remained an Anglican uh, Christian uh, and uh, for many years I chaired various uh, in, uh, committees for the Anglican Church of Canada, uh, the Primates Rural Relief and Development Fund, uh, the Anglican Church of Canada's international engagements, and I also was a member of the Anglican Consultative Council uh, representing uh, uh, Canadian Anglicans uh, for uh, nine years, I guess. Mm -hmm. Also at um, around 16, 17, one sometimes becomes interested in politics <laughs> um, with uh, classes, civil um, classes and so on. Uh, did you become interested in politics? Yes, in fact I was always interested in politics even from an earlier age, uh, partly because my father was very interested in politics. He was a, a news hound and really uh, spent a lot of time uh, trying to figure out what was going on in the world. Uh, so we always had conversations at the dinner table about uh, about political issues uh, and as I mentioned I would say my father came up through a part of the church which was represented by uh, a connection to uh, social causes mm. uh, uh, even though he, he was an Anglo-Catholic. Mm. And you said he was somewhat left-wing. Yes, somewhat. I mean, in a moderate way, I would yeah. say. But uh, but he believed in um, uh, social justice, the desire to have greater equality within society. And part of that came from his background as a Newfoundlander because uh, Newfoundland was in many ways run by family compacts mm. uh, in, in the 19th and into the 20th centuries. And there was a real sense of social division between the haves and the have-nots. And he grew up uh, as a have-not, uh, not, in a, not in great poverty, but certainly not mm. being privileged in any way. And I think it had a big impact on his, uh, his political sensibilities. How would you characterize your own political sensibilities? Um, I would I would describe myself as a radical centrist. Uh, <laughs> I, I really am. I, I, I'm a I'm very pragmatic. I would say in my politics, um, and I I'm very interested in trying to find mechanisms that actually improve people's lives broadly, rather than mechanisms that create. Um, further inequality and in that I, I think I share that sense with my father I think mm. trying to uh, find economic and social means through policy that actually improves the lot of the, the vast majority of people is where I think politics should be. Mm. So let's go on to university where did you go and what did you study? So I have to go back to uh, John Whitman, mm. uh, my drama professor or teacher. Uh, when I was graduating in Quebec at the time, there was a new uh, system where you went to 11 years of high school and then two years of a kind of community college, which was mm. called Cégep en français. And uh, I wasn't convinced that this new system was going to work well for me because it felt to me like just an elongation of high school experience. It didn't seem like it was going to be very challenging. So I wanted to try and find a mechanism, frankly, to avoid that. And there were only a couple of universities in Canada that would admit people directly from high school in Quebec without having gone to uh, this community college. I went to investigate one of those universities and I wasn't very inspired. I, uh, I, I went, I visited, I came away and I thought mm. I don't think this is really going to be very exciting. And so John Whitman uh, looked at me and said why don't you go to Harvard? And I was taken aback and I mm. said well I've never thought of going to Harvard uh, and I, my family can't afford 
Mm -hmm. um, me going to uh, an American university, much less Harvard, which was very expensive at the time. Uh, but he said, uh, look, just apply and see what happens. Mm -hmm. uh, and I re he said, I really think you can do this. Uh, and so I did apply, and of course, different world. I had applied, applied late, so I was past the, the admissions deadline. So of course, today, it would be impossible. That mm -hmm. would have been the end of the story. But at the time, there was more flexibility. And um, I was called a couple of weeks later by the director of admissions at Harvard, whose name, another wonderful man, L. Fred Jewett. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Fred Jewett uh, said, we really would like you to come here. Um, and he happened to be in charge of Canadian admissions. I was lucky mm -hmm. on that. And then he said, I don't yet know what financial support we can provide. Uh, is it necessary for you to get financial support to come? And I said, well, unfortunately it is. I said, my parents can't mm -hmm. afford to send me. So um, make a long story short, a couple of weeks later, he called and said, you have a full scholarship and will you come? And so I ended up going to Harvard, uh, which was a great experience. And again, I think set me on a trajectory, much like drama, mm -hmm. that shaped uh, a lot of the rest of my life. And you were doing English literature? English history and literature. History. I was very lucky. Um, I entered, uh, you enter Harvard in no uh, program originally, your fresh, first year, freshman year, you get to explore, uh, which is, you know, an interesting opportunity, which I did. And I then had to apply into a very special program called the Committee Granting Degrees in History and Literature, which is a, a tiny program. Um, and I was accepted into it. And it was fabulous because it gave you immediate access to uh, tutorials very similar to the tutorials that we would have here or supervisions that we would have here at Cambridge. Very small group and then also access to the one very to top one? professors. Uh, in my case, sometimes two or three to one. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. very, uh, and sometimes two tutors, one in history and one in literature working together. Uh, so it was a great experience uh, and also connected me with some very, very eminent professors at an early stage in my career, which was very inspiring. Well, tell me one or two who inspired you most. Uh, there were, uh, I, I will mention uh, two. Um, one was actually a visiting professor from Yale named Edward Mendelssohn, uh, who is uh, the uh, literary executor of Auden, mm -hmm. uh, interestingly enough. And uh, he was, at the time, relatively young. I think he was an associate professor. Uh, and he taught modernist literature. And here there's a continuity from that North American literature class with John Whitman to this class with Edward Mendelssohn. So I felt I'd already thought about some of the issues and themes that were important, but Mendelssohn uh, was just a brilliant professor and really engaged me in, in deep, deep thinking around modernist writing. Uh, Pound, uh, Auden, Eliot, um, uh, Virginia Woolf, etc. So that was fabulous. Uh, the other person I must single out uh, was um, uh, Wallace McCaffrey, who was a Tudor historian uh, and the chair of the Department of, uh, of History. Uh, and he became my, th uh, in this program at Harvard, one wrote a dissertation thesis, uh, long paper, uh, in the last year. And he became my supervisor, even though I wasn't doing Tudor history. Uh, I, I did work on uh, 18th century uh, forest communities in Nottinghamshire. Mm -hmm. uh, but he supervised the work, uh, and he was just wonderful, a, a really encouraging, uh, rigorous, but supportive uh, supervisor, and I learned a lot from that. Were you influenced by E.P. Thompson? I certainly was. <laughs> <laughs> I was. Um, in fact, uh, to go back a step, uh, when I was in my second year at Harvard, uh, in those tutorials uh, that I mentioned, I read quite a lot of E.P. Thompson, uh, Making the English Working Class, Wigs and Hunters, mm -hmm. and it was Wigs and Hunters mm -hmm. that started me thinking about uh, what I later discovered was legal history. <laughs> I wasn't thinking, I was thinking of it as social history, but I, it really uh, engaged me as legal history and it's what started me on the path to law ultimately, uh, although I didn't know it at the time. Well, since we've got a rush on, um, 
let's uh, go on to the path to law. T- tell me about your subsequent career in mm-hmm. legal fields. When I was at Harvard, I had a fundamental decision to make. I continued acting there and uh, did, did a lot of theater. And I had to decide whether to continue in theater uh, as a career, which some of my colleagues did, uh, or whether to do a PhD in history, which I was quite keen on doing, or uh, to think about studying law. And at the end of the day, I decided that I probably wasn't Mm. gifted enough to be a professional actor. Mm. Uh, I thought about history very, very strongly, uh, but I ultimately decided that that I had become really intrigued by the functioning of law, how it works as a, as a discipline, how it works within society. And so I chose to go to law and I went uh, to uh, law school back in Canada because I, at that moment, didn't want to disengage myself from the Canadian context. So I uh, applied, believe it or not, I mean, it, in retrospect, it seems terribly arrogant, but I applied only to one law school. Mm which was McGill, uh, because it had a program in both the common law and the civil law, uh, Canada having both those systems, Quebec and the rest of the country. And uh, that turned out to be a fabulous choice for me. It was a very uh, supportive uh, faculty, very collegial, and really fundamentally interested in comparative law and in international law. And that was what I knew I was most interested in. And that goes right back to earlier days. Believe it or not, in my high school yearbook, I said I wanted to be an international lawyer. And that's actually what happened with those digressions through my education. Um, And then on to your career, what what did you do after you? So I finished, uh, it was a four-year program in law uh, because it was two different degrees in common law and civil law. And that was after four years at Harvard. So I'd already studied for eight years and I wanted to do a PhD at that point because I knew then that I wanted to teach law. I didn't want to uh, become a practicing lawyer, although I have done a lot of advising over the years. Uh, But uh, I therefore wanted to go to a place that was really outstanding for international law and to have a supervisor who I thought I would really respect. And that was Cambridge and Sir Derek Bowett. Uh, So I was very fortunate. I applied uh, to various scholarships uh, because again, I couldn't have afforded to come here Mm -hmm. if I hadn't been on scholarship. I was uh, granted a Commonwealth scholarship and I wrote to Sir Derek and asked him whether or not he would be willing to supervise me. I sent some writing samples, etc. And he very quickly wrote back and said, yes, uh, assuming you uh, are admitted, all, all goes smoothly, I would be delighted to supervise you. And so I knew right from the beginning, even though the system was that I was not registered for any degree when I first arrived, the normal uh, t- uh, uh, arrangement at the time, I then went on and I uh, worked with him uh, on international arbitration between states and private parties. And it was tr- a wholly positive experience. He was a mm-hmm. superb supervisor, challenging, totally reliable, and it's one of the things I learned from him. He handed things back almost days after receiving them. I, I, I've tried to model myself as a as a supervisor on him. And then when I finished with that, um, I was very fortunate uh, to be chosen as a law clerk at the Supreme Court of Canada, working for the Chief Justice of Canada then at a crucial moment in Canadian legal history. The new Charter of Rights and Freedoms had just been promulgated. And so all of the early cases were being decided under the Charter. And my uh, boss, the Chief Justice, uh, was really one of the two or three leading members of the court in in setting a framework for Canadian law which persists to this day. So it was an enormous privilege to be working at that time on all of those really fundamental issues. And then I was very fortunate to be um, uh, hired to become a law professor Mm -hmm. at uh, McGill University where I had studied Mm -hmm. and I was there for uh, 15 years teaching international law and some other areas of law. And then much of your career subsequently, missing out all your international human rights work and everything else, was in in administration as Mm -hmm. vice-chancellor in various places and so on. Why did you choose that path? 
Well, in many ways I didn't choose it, in all honesty. Uh, what happened was at McGill, uh, there happened to be a kind of generational gap. There had been a weak hiring for a period, so there was a very great cohort of senior uh, people at the university, then a less strong, if I may say, cohort of mid-career people, and then a cohort of quite uh, engaged, and I may say, uh, w not speaking of myself, but my colleagues, talented uh, mm. people at the next generation. And so what happened was I was asked to become dean at McGill when I was 32. So I was very young. Uh, I was only an associate professor, uh, and I was very unsure about doing that. Uh, but I was prevailed upon uh, to take on that role. I and I did it and happily it went well and accomplished some quite important things for the university and the, and the faculty and that I guess is sort of set me on a path that I had not really chosen. Mm -hmm. I'd never imagined that I wanted to be a university president or vice mm -hmm. chancellor. It was just not on my radar screen, mm -hmm. so to speak. Um, I'd always imagined my career as being primarily about international law. Uh, but then uh, after I stepped down, I was invited to be president of a foundation, the Pierre Elliott Trudeau mm -hmm. Foundation, which was wonderful, setting up a new foundation, well endowed. And from that, um, I was um, headhunted, I suppose, mm. to be the president of the University of British Columbia. Mm. And that was a, a fundamental choice at that moment, both moving to British Columbia, a very different part of mm. Canada, and then deciding that I would indeed be willing to take on a university uh, presidency. And I talked with a lot of people, got lots of advice, and I, I ultimately decided I would do it. But it was by no means uh, a career uh, a career choice that I made at an early stage. So as the Zen proverb would say, you didn't choose this career, it chose you. It's a bit like the sorting hat in Harry Potter as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, finally, Cambridge. Um, I can't resist the temptation to ask you just to reflect, we've only got three or four minutes, uh, on one or two things that you've either learnt or would cherish about your time here. Well, uh, I'll, I'll speak of things that I would cherish. Um, uh, one is uh, clearly all of the work that's been done across the university uh, addressing uh, the issue of uh, access and participation for traditionally excluded groups. Uh, so students from black communities, from Pakistani, Bangladeshi communities, working white working class boys. There are a number of communities that just haven't been coming to Cambridge, even though there are of course talented people in those communities. And I've been really inspired by work that's being done across the university to address those gaps, the foundation year, uh, the new scholarship opportunities, uh, the Cambridge bursary program, etc. So that's one. Another thing I will cherish is simply the fundamental commitment to truly excellent work at a globally sophisticated level, if I may put it that way. I get to travel pre-COVID across the university and seeing people in physics, in anthropology, in sociology, in chemistry, operating at the highest, highest levels of achievement and influence is just remarkable. Uh, and I think this is a university that has succeeded generation after generation in encouraging and supporting that level of work. And that's something truly to cherish. Finally, what are you going to do now? Um, I am I suppose most importantly, moving closer to my family, the the uh, the, the COVID years uh, really, uh, uh, quite honestly, took a toll in uh, in really feeling frustratedly disconnected from children and grandchildren. So I'm moving to a city in Toronto where every single member of my family happens now to live just by accident. <laughs> so that'll be wonderful. And then I'll be heading up uh, the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research 
which is a wonderful organization. It's a global organization focused on building networks to address some of the hardest challenges facing science and humanity. So antimicrobial resistance to uh, economic inequality uh, and bringing together top, top people, often led by Nobel laureates and comparable people, uh, to address those issues across disciplines and across geographies. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. Well, thank you very much indeed for a rather rushed but wonderful interview. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Three. Take a long pole and punt gently back towards the greenest of green grass in a boat brimful of starlight, singing out loud in the splendor of the starlight. I cannot sing aloud now. The flute and panpipes of parting have gone silent. Even the clamorous summer insects are hushed for me. Silence tonight in Cambridge. Quietly, quietly I am leaving, just as quietly as I came. Careful not to brush away with my sleeve the faintest wisp of a cloud. <laughs>